What, then, is a memory which we do not recall? Or indeed, let us go further. We do not recall our memories of the last thirty years, but we are wholly steeped in them. Why then stop short at thirty years? Why not extend this previous life back to before our birth? If I do not know a whole section of the memories that are behind me, if they are invisible to me, if I do not have the faculty of recalling them to me, how do I know whether in that mass that is unknown to me, there may not be some that extend back much further than my human existence? If I can have in me and round me so many memories which I do not remember, this oblivion, a de facto oblivion at least, since I have not the faculty of seeing anything, may extend over a life which I have lived in the body of another man, even another planet. A common oblivion obliterates everything. But what, in that case, is the meaning of that immortality of the soul, the reality of which the Norwegian philosopher affirmed? The being that I shall be after death has no more reason to remember the man I have been since my birth than the latter to remember what I was before it. Hey, this is Nathan. This is David. And this is Nick. And welcome back to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. For today, we're continuing on our Proust journey through In Search of Lost Time, this time going through Volume 4, Sodom and Gomorrah. And two disclaimers we throw at the beginning of every episode. Number one, we were talking about the modern library's Moncrief and Kilmartin translation. And number two, our French pronunciations are generally quite bad. So apologies in advance for that. So, without further ado, let's kick off a recap of what happens in this book. So, first 50 to 100 pages are awesome out of the gates. We had basically left off being exhausted with book three, the incessant salons and continued extended conversations and huge amounts of dialogue kind of wiped us out. But the beginning of this book, we see that the narrator kind of has this snooping, uh, voyeuristic observation of Charlou and Jupien's romance. Um, And we get this whole flower comparison, potentially flawed metaphor about homosexuality. But in my opinion, this is very much an impressive thing just for the level of writing about homosexuality in the early 1920s when this book was released. So I guess, open question, what was your guys' impression for this one right off the bat? I think you kind of covered all the bases there, that it was a return to the Proust that I like reading, which is more philosophical, more wandering, less dialogue inside of a salon. But it does have a sort of interesting yet troubled metaphor about flowers and inversion, yet still (laughs) respectful for bravery, for going and treating it more so openly at the time. And still interesting to read. Mm -hmm. And you get to see our, one thing, you get to see our our narrator be, in in this book in particular, especially starting at the very beginning, sort of breaking that fourth wall and talking directly to the reader and introducing more of himself into the narrative. You see him, I think at one time, snooping. He throws himself up against a building like he's, you know, trying not to be seen so he can get into this empty building to over here, two men really, you know, going at it. So, uh, yeah, great opening. <laughs> great opening. Yeah, there's kind of like light, like mystery vibes, yeah. like hard-boiled detective, like just totally hiding behind whatever thing in the courtyard with his hat over his eyes. So nobody could see him. So I was like, wow, Proust is really, he's going genre fiction in this one. Yeah, and this is the scene that he mentions in the previous book, right? He mentions briefly, like some he observes something and he'll talk about that or he'll share that later yeah you're right and then it jumps right into it and there's been like up until this point there's been a lot of kind of insinuations especially about charlou and his his lifestyle mm-hmm. and yeah this book just like kind of jumps right into it and there's some great there's some great passages that i, I did not record where he's very kind of i think i take it that this would have been fairly radical at the time but he's very em- empathetic to Charlou, who, you know, in the last book was really a dick to him when he yeah. like goes over to his house and he's just like tearing into him. Yeah. And he kind of lays out that that this 
inversion, as he calls it, is much more normal and much more common than anybody is willing to believe in society. Even, you know, people who are homosexual or not, that there's this overwhelming feeling that, you know, you're kind of alone. I I don't know where that passage is, but it's it's pretty powerful. Yeah, I imagine uh, that somewhere somebody is kind of analyzing and perhaps critiquing some of the language and failed metaphors in this section. But just alone, like your point, Nathan, like that type of statement, like to be written on paper in like the early 1920s was very much against the grain. And so that one got me kind of fired up about this volume to start. And it's funny. I mean, he titles the book Sodom and Gomorrah and he makes it pretty clear that he's taking that metaphor quite uh, literally throughout the book, you know, in terms of homosexual men and women. Mm. So I was going to say, Nathan, he makes that direct reference to to Sodom and Gomorrah in that one passage to talk about how, you know, after the the people of these cities were kind of dispersed biblically, they've been working their way back and finding each other and slowly forming in each city around the world. Like, I don't know if I have it. Let's see here. So it says, uh, but a day or two later, I received proof of this young woman's tendencies and also of the probability of her having known Albertine in the past. Often in the hall of the casino, when two girls were smitten with mutual desire, a sort of luminous phenomenon occurred, as it were a phosphorescent trail flashing from one to the other. It may be noted, incidentally, that it is by the aid of such materializations, impalpable though they may be, by these astral signs that set as a whole section of the atmosphere ablaze, that Gamora, dispersed, tends in every town, in every village, to reunite its separated members to rebuild the biblical city while everywhere the same efforts are being made, if only in view of an intermittent reconstruction by the nostalgic, the hypocritical, sometimes the courageous exiles of Sodom. Yeah, that what we see in the beginning and then sort of is which is its main focus is really a theme and a thread throughout this entire book on top of Mm -hmm. all other kinds of love. It's interesting though, like in the, in this passage, uh, with that passage you just read, was that from the beginning, kind of the first 50 pages as well? No, that's later after he um, Reunites sees with Albertine. Albertine and I can't remember the other girl's name, are dancing. And Cotard sort of makes reference like, hey, look at those two. And that's when he begins his slow descent into jealousy and frustration. Slow descent? Slow. I feel like these are rap- rapid and repeated. Immediate and increasingly confusing as a reader. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just going to note the, the sort of difference between the attitudes of the, I don't know, what do you want to say, author, narrator, and the attitudes of the character protagonist, even though they're ostensibly the same person. Are they? Because he's, he's well, aren't they? I, I never assumed that. I Well, there's a... <laughs> the, I mean, Perennial question here. The passages that I read where he kind of breaks the fourth wall there, I really got the impression that this protagonist lying down to sleep kind of merged with Proust lying in bed writing this novel. I think there's, yeah, undoubtedly a lot of connections and similarities, but I I don't don't, don't think you can read into it as being his opinion or thoughts. Yeah. No, no, I agree with that. That's not that's okay. not exactly what I meant. Just that the yeah, I'm not saying that we could that we should take either of these things to be Proust, the human being, his personal thoughts necessarily. But it's the the book ostensibly is the reflections of the life of this character from the perspective of this character who remains nameless, I believe. Um but that these passages that are very empathetic to the to homosexuality and the condition in society are they conflict with his uh feelings about albertine oh i see what you're saying yes and like he yeah. can't he can't accept yes. it her and he's like very upset and very disgusted yeah. in her uh, proclivities whatever his or his assumptions because he doesn't even really know but that like torments him the whole book even though we have these beautiful passages so it's like seem much more empathetic and exciting. I mean, it's it's very much the same concept as Rachel went from the Lord with St. Lou, right? So St. Lou is tormented by this person 
who he's madly infatuated with, right? But to other people, she exists simply as a prostitute Mm -hmm. in this other capacity. And so Proust can, or rather the narrator, or as Proust writes about the narrator, I I think this is proto-autofiction. So we're just having the perpetual auto fiction <laughs> argument. Like, is it really, you know, so I, they blend together. Yeah. So I'm just going to be incorrect if that is the incorrect statement. But essentially the narrator, like he wants to be able to separate the two, but, but when it becomes personal for mm. him, he can't. And that's exactly what happened with mm. St. Lou as well. Like the way you picture someone is like your projection on them. And when it doesn't fit, that becomes a thing that can drive you yeah. mad. And, and he makes reference to that near the end of the book. Uh, throw this out there. He says, Being, in spite of myself, still pursued in my jealousy by the memory of St. Lou's relations with Rachel and from the Lord, and of Swans with Odette, I was too inclined to believe that once I was in love. I could not be loved in return, and that pecuniary interest alone could attach a woman to me. No doubt it was foolish to judge Albertine by Odette and Rachel, but it was not her that I was afraid of. It was myself. It was the feelings that I was capable of inspiring that my jealousy made me underestimate. And from this judgment, possibly erroneous, sprang no doubt many of the calamities that would befall us. So he's doing a few things there, He's, which is really interesting. He's tying his situation to the situation we've already read. And he's doing what Nathan already talked about before, which is he's setting up your expectations about what's going to happen. He's like, oh, something bad's going to mm-hmm. happen, but that'll come later. Mm-hmm. But a lot of that at the end of this book is yeah. just him talking about how fools people are for being in love and how it just totally fucks with your perception of reality. And yet you keep doing it and keep going mm-hmm. down that down that trap. So speaking of the end of the book, because we've already gotten there, let's That's get back to do. the beginning yeah. of the book <laughs> for the recap. So after the early Charlou and, and Jupian romance, um, it becomes apparent that Charlou is going to become even larger kind of main component of this volume, right? And much to my chagrin, you know, despite really liking the first chunk, we end up very quickly back in the party scene. And so in this case, the narrator goes to the Germans again. Um, Charlou, again, gets a lot of the spotlight. We see him kind of uh, being attracted to two very young men and kind of like trying to feel out that situation while their mother was there and somewhat like not cognizant of what was happening. And so that's just the first of many Charlu interactions throughout this volume. Um, but from there, an interesting aspect that Proust still hasn't dropped, which is the topic of uh, the Dreyfus affair, where we hear that Swan has had this discussion with uh, um, uh, German about how the prince and princess are now pro-Dreyfusards, where they used to be anti-Dreyfusards. But in secret, right? So there's Is that still my understanding? In secret, right. And so they didn't want it known, right? But they're kind of, they're kind of shifting. And so it's this kind of separate, I don't know, entity or, or under the rug thing that's being swept there. And so I'm interested to see if that ever comes back. Um, so TBD on that one. Uh, so we continue on and we've kind of leapt ahead already to the obsessions with Albertine, but at that point, these are really starting to pick up and we see the situation where the narrator really wants to meet her. Um, it's late at night. She calls to cancel, but he obsessively just begs her to come just anyway. Just guilts her into it. And so, yeah, just guilts her like nobody's having a good time. Yeah. And, uh, Sorry, one thing. <laughs> this is like the first of many throughout the book where we see the character really actually doing things that we haven't really like the previous three books has been him observing and reporting on history or memory. Mm -hmm. And here we're like in it and he's doing actions and I'm, Mm. he's kind of, I mean, not kind of, he, he's not very likable, which I don't mind. I I don't need a character to be likable. It's just, it's so shocking that we're getting halfway through this massive tone before we really fully get to see him doing and acting and being more involved in the world. It's mm-hmm. it's funny too because there's there's like I thought I liked this character because of the observations in the writing like we talked yeah. about when he leaned in to kiss Albertine in the last book and or no two books ago two books ago two books Within ago yeah. Budding Grove who knows yeah because this this and is the return has, to like, uh, the 
the band of girls in Battle yeah. Back and him, I think, I don't know if he's sleeping with them, but he's certainly getting romantic, whatever that meant back then, like at least kissing mm-hmm. quite a few of them. He's having a good time. He, yeah, he's, he's having a good time. <laughs> I don't even know. If, I don't even know if they were kissing. I don't know. I don't, yeah, who I don't, knows? All these euphemisms, but you know, he like leans in for this kiss, and then he's like, "How could how could the world exist outside of my mind? Everything exists within me." And he's having this like, you know, just ridiculous philosophical moment. And so it's like, oh, this, this it's kind of funny. I kind of like this guy, but then when you actually see him in action, he's a total douche, <laughs> whiny, needy. And I wonder if it's like, I okay, I agree with Nick. I feel like this is like autofiction. Proust is writing about his life. And I wonder if it's him looking back and be like, I was a douche. Well. I mean, who wasn't when they were young and in love? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, sorry, to, go, to make this autofiction thing a little more relevant, I don't know where I saw this, but someone suggested if you were to take, and maybe this also might just be total foolishness, and just a thing that's just exists in the French language, but the women that he's in love with, if you were to take the last part of their name off, it would make a masculine name, a male name. Oh, mm-hmm. I noticed that too. Well, you have yeah. like Gilbert. Yeah. Gilbert, Albertine, Albert. Yeah. Even Albertine's seemingly romant, I think, uh, starts with an A as well. With the other? He also thinks he's in love with her. Andre. But Andrea, yeah. Anyway. Sorry, Nick. To... <laughs> it's it's my job to keep this train rolling. And so we're going to get back on this train, which is actually a scene later, so we'll, we'll get to trains. <laughs> um, but at this point, we shift back to Baalbek. Um, there is kind of that nice, I would say, beautiful passage about like his mom, and she's getting older, and he kind of starts to see his grandmother. And oh, his man, mom. the intermittency that kind of, merges with of the, the heart or whatever. That, yeah, the intermittency yeah, of the heart and how your memory works to deal with sadness and, and all that. Um, that, was a, that was a heavy hitter passage. Yeah, and we one talked of the best about, parts of the book. Yeah, we talked about in the last one how he kind of doesn't seem to feel the grief of his grandmother passing. Mm. And now kind of, you know, the other shoe drops. Proust. But again, briefly, and then he... <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know which is natural you go back to life but yeah exactly and so thus he does and so the topic of albertine being a lesbian reappears and so this like completely restirs up all of his erratic behaviors and he's trying to do these manipulation things to just get her attention back to him you guys say that this volume is where he shows up and i i do agree in like a percentage standpoint all of these things have happened multiple times throughout the first three volumes. Like his, his basically like infatuation and like attempted manipulation. And yeah, yeah, yeah. he really only likes a woman if she is uninterested in him. And then when it aligns, he's lost interest. I mean, you see it in one of his first actions as well. When he goes into a fit, when his mother won't kiss him goodnight, not to get yeah, Freudian, right. but it all kind of, <laughs> comes back from that was little scene but anyway yeah that pro that prophecy at wow the end. yeah yeah great point point did <laughs> uh so from there we get to be introduced to the character of morel so the young violinist kind of enters the picture and charlu sort of like who's that guy and kind of pretends that he knows him and kind of introduces himself finds a way to meet him and then for a large part of kind of the remaining book, we have this Charlu and, and Morel like ongoing relationship that is somewhat tumultuous. Maybe I don't know, perhaps like I don't want to say predatory. That seems maybe too strong of a word, but definitely some heavy uh, pulling of the strings on Charlu's side. And Very so, manipulative on both sides. I mean, Morel is another also true. Yeah. He's also really kind of a creep. Yeah, just an awful human being. Like yeah. <laughs> there's some passages where he's interacting with our our protagonist and he's like being real nice when he's trying to get a favor and then as soon as he gets that favor he's just completely ignores him and he's like he's also like trying to play this game trying to advance in society trying to get something yeah and he's definitely i mean a little bit further in the book he's had like arranged or attempted arrangements with uh uh, Monsieur de Germain, right? Oh, that's right. And those have sort of fallen through, and that was sort of at that same context as the story with Charlou and the fake duel. Yeah, that 
when Morel was was ignoring him. He like created this whole story about like kind of exposing you know their relationship as a as like a something contingent upon this duel, and then it basically caused Morel to like run back to him and spend like only time with him. I was like, it, it wasn't the son of the. A- the meetup with the Duke de Germain, wasn't that at a brothel? And then Charlou like bribed somebody at the brothel to let him spy on them. Didn't this happen? This is like back to that hard boiled Proust. I what you're talking about sounds familiar, but I will say that this book is testing my limits of brain capacity. <laughs> <laughs> Did that happen? Was that in a Godard movie I just watched? I don't know. I feel like there was a section. We're not there yet. But there was a section about three quarters of the way through this book. We can be anywhere. Where a lot of stuff suddenly started happening. Right? And I was like, what did, what happened? What Suddenly this is an action book. I mean, that's why this book to me is certainly ahead of volume number three. Oh, is it? Yeah. I mean. I'm with you on that one. For those, for those items. Um like the beginning passage, that that beautiful intermittency of the heart, plus these kind of, as you described them, we'll say Proustian and hard-boiled fiction. Like it just it just moves more. But I also know that my own brain is filtering out the fact that there's still a shitload of salon party scene dialogue and etymologies in this one as well. Pages and of French etymologies. Yeah, I, something is happening, and maybe it's because I'm getting tired of it. I just, I forgot, I forget all of it. Yeah. Like, it's, it's like I read passages of etymology <laughs> where I'll, I'll be at the uh, Verderin Salon and then all of a sudden I'm like, wait, I just read like 10 pages. I don't remember what just happened because nothing happened. Yeah. And the writing, while yeah. good, is not as explosive or interesting or investigating something more unique and curious about the heart or the soul that you want to remember i guess there's just so much of it <laughs> yeah that... I, I don't i don't know this does i i would agree this book does move more but it felt much more uneven actually to me because yeah but i'll i'll take unevenness <laughs> if, if i get some action finally okay. <laughs> i'm done with the slow burn yeah you, you've give had me the, give me the scenes. nearly 2000 pages of slow burn up to this point nathan how much more do you need <laughs> <laughs> I was just getting into a groove. Yeah. The, but the action just like it was like like watching a Bellatar film. By hour four, you're like, all right, yeah. all right. And then when it's over, like that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and so from there, we basically resume this infinite loop of the narrator getting bored with Albertine after he was obsessed with Albertine and sort of flipping back and forth. And so big shocker. So. When she has plans with other women that he suspects is a lesbian arrangement, he gets jealous again and he gets super depressed. And, you know, he kind of matches that same behavior of Charlou. So, David, you had you had read the thing uh, earlier that's kind of linking all of these individual character behaviors in their moments of love and or infatuation, depending on how those are broken out. Uh, but he basically makes up a story about a relationship that didn't work out in order to kind of emotionally manipulate Albertine and have her come back to Paris with him. And then as much as I struggle sometimes with how slow paced this is, Proust always sticks the landing or has thus far in all these volumes because like the last page where basically the narrator just on a whim decides that he tells his mom that he must marry Albertine. Yeah. I was like, what? Now I'm interested. Twist ending. Well, yeah. What else are you gonna do with your possibly lesbian girlfriend? You gotta, you gotta marry her. Who you kind of don't like and don't like. Resent. Yeah, it seems to be a marriage done purely out of spite and jealousy. It's a, it's a challenge marriage when, when it's not gonna work, but you put all your effort in anyway. I mean, I guess we don't know that they're going to get married. No. Yes, that is to be determined. But the statement that he is going to has yeah. happened. Although he did sort of give us a spoiler that they're in for some troubles. Somehow that's not surprising. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he does express some affection for her, but it's intermittent and not nearly as believable as his contempt. <laughs> yeah, the contempt really shines <laughs> through. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, as much as this has been a test of 
you know, how much your brain can deal with 40 pages in a row of etymology of, you know, place names, which by the way, I still have a question about the whole place name thing. If anybody wants to tell me, explain what, what's going on with place names and why that's so repeated. Don't know. Don't care. Well, yeah. <laughs> it, it's almost... <laughs> but with all of that, it's still awesome, even though I was tired yeah. of it. Now I'm into it again. I got to be honest, this book did it more than the third book for me. Nathan, you seem by your <laughs> look to be... <laughs> in a different camp but <laughs> yeah i'm with you nick i think this this did what book one and two did where it's like a roller coaster of really high highs really low lows and by the end i'm like oh let's do that again <laughs> <laughs> you know proust has become much more like a lifestyle for me now that when i, I it's mustache, not even about like in line in, in bed all day yeah yeah you readers or you listeners can't see, but um, yeah, blossoming into a young Proust here. Mm. Uh, but it's like, it's less Edmund about. And... <laughs> now gay. It's less about like enjoyment in the moment, but I enjoy my 10 pages of Proust a day. I just sit down and I read my 10 pages. And once I finish the book, I miss having the Proust to open up and read. And mm. it's just, it's become a companion his voice. I agree with you on that, but I also accidentally read a shorter, well-designed novel after this, and I realized how much of a novel Proust is not writing at all. Like I, read, I basically read a Garcia Marquez book. I was like, holy shit, this is how you structure a plot. This is how you introduce characters that are relevant and how you don't introduce characters that are not relevant. Like Everything you created in this is on an arc that is useful to the narrative. Proust is not doing that at all. What is Proust doing? I mean, I think there's a moment um, where kind of related to the passages that I read I, at the beginning, I think, where he kind of acknowledges that he's dying and he reflects on Swan's dying. And it, it makes me think that, you know, maybe there was someone like Swan in his life and he thought like, what, what is this? Where is that? Where are all of those memories? And if this isn't really impassioned attempt to make himself immortal, to make his memory immortal. It certainly might be that. This was the last book published in his lifetime. Everything we read from here on out is posthumous. And I think it becomes more aware that he's writing from a sort of deathbed. I'm not entirely sure. This is just what I've gleaned. But it certainly feels that way. I mean, the book, it's weird to call it, it is weird to call it a novel because it doesn't really feel like that. It, it feels much more like mm -hmm. a, a narrative meditation on memory and consciousness more than anything else. I, I don't fully know yet, but I think you're, you're closer to what it might be than to what it might not be. Nick, you got an, an idea? Yeah, I like that. And... Further evidence of it perhaps not being a quote-unquote novel is, did you guys pick up on the reference to Swan being dead? Well, he is already? dead, right? He died at some well, point in this book. He died, but it's obviously not a main thing. Yeah, I think there's only one sentence. I don't even yeah. remember reading and a sentence. It. Except, well, yeah, it's, it's just in the middle of you know whatever stuff that's happening. That says, uh, she had even mentioned the Virderin's name in the course of a visit of condolence, which she had paid to Madame Swan after the death of her husband. Does yeah. it? Yeah. I remember reading that and going, oh, like, that was okay. Yeah, I have it in my notes. I was like, he's, he's dead now, which was, of course, stated that he was going to die. Yeah. But like spending so much time with that character and buried in the middle of some arbitrary collection of details is just a very small statement that oh yeah this thing happened he died yeah. and there was condolences that passed and his his reappearance at the beginning of the book i i enjoyed though it was good to see it was good to see old swan one last time yeah you know? swan, love swan is my favorite character i think he he's he's like a actually a man of principles and a man of taste and he seems like mm -hmm. maybe the only one and yet still with odette well you can't control it can't control Even the what best of you. us. I, I almost think that's the one happy love story in the book as well. Like he actually, you know, obviously they had a they had a tumultuous 
sort of courtship in the first book, but it, it would seem that he genuinely loved her and they had, mm. it would seem a happy marriage. And in the face of a society that rejected them and rejected his choice and rejected her and they, she manages in this book to build a salon to, to like kind of build a culture around her, which is interesting. She doesn't come, she doesn't have a name. She doesn't come from culture. And Proust writes this like dismissively about her, but that's an achievement, right? And Swan also is a man who built himself up by his own abilities. He, he also wasn't born into it, but he's also seen as sort of an outsider. It, this is one thing that I, maybe aside from the sort of passages on consciousness that I appreciate most about this book is the way that Proust walks this line as he presents his heroes as, or I read them as heroes, but he presents them as like the contemptible people, except Swan. He kind of likes Swan. And then he presents the contemptible people as if, as if they're the heroes, you know, are the veterans or uh, the princess. And- yeah. And they're just awful yeah. people. But he manages with his words to like cloak them and like cloak them in the in so that you you in reading about it, I like I want to find what it is about this person that makes them important. Why what 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 makes them right? Because he keeps cloaking them in the garb of uh that you know they're the good people in society and these are the the not so good people in society by cloaking them in the words of being not good, but their actions and mm-hmm. is is invert is inverted of that. Yeah, and you see that. There's, there was one scene that really stuck out with me because I feel like it's the first we really see uh, a different sort of class, like directly, is when they kick that. I don't, I don't know. I think it might be a farmer or something. They kick him off the train. The, oh, off the oh, train. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's treated as like such a normal thing to occur, and like as if the man, I can't remember who it was. Now that kicked. It was. I think it was. Cotard, who did was it, it for the it? princess? For the princess, yeah. I think yeah, that's, I think that's right. what it was. He was doing it like for her honor and for her respect. And it was treated like this most normal thing. But other than that, I don't remember seeing a lot of passages that show class as much, which is surprising considering the time. Well, there's also, I mean, he interacts a lot with like the staff of the hotel, which is kind that's of true, takes a larger actually. part of this. Like he, he talks to the... I want to find this passage. He talks to yeah. the lift boy quite lift a lot. Boy, yeah, he keeps yeah. like coming back late. And but it all has that. Oh, and the lift boy doesn't. Mm. Good. He comes back exhausted, and the lift boy is just like going on and on about his sister. Yeah. You guys remember this passage? I do. Where? Hold on, I gotta find it. <laughs> I just remembered another thing that happened in the book. Didn't Morel get the chauffeur fired from the Verderon's estate? Oh, he like that's framed right. him for no reason. Do you remember this? Because he was too honest about something. Yeah. Or, or too revealing. Yeah, I vaguely remember this. He just like ruins his life out of spite. <laughs> yeah. And and which is maybe interesting because Morel also comes from the same class as that guy. Maybe that's why. I mean, yeah, I think like Nathan, your point about how people are people are shown in this way where the heroes are contemptible and the contemptible could be heroes and people of the high class behave poorly but also morel behaves poorly i think it's at some level an exercise or a lesson in scope and context because if you get the full view of everyone we're all not so great we have frail human brains and jealousies and greeds and desire for attention and power and i think i think proust again in a non-novel type of approach is showing all of that. He's not filtering or or adjusting what he reveals. It's just like here's all the details of these people. You figure out what you latch on. But he's also not. He's also not fair, which I think, which is interesting to me because I think like two characters that he's really not fair to. I think are Rachel, one from the Lord, and Albertine, who are both sort of underprivileged young women without great prospects who seem to be genuinely good people. Maybe there are. There are cer- certainly societal judgments on their actions, but their characters seem to be good. And it's like, how do you weigh the character of an individual against how they're perceived in society? And he definitely yeah. favors the I mean, society. I would argue that a lot of his, I mean, his writing kind of outlines a lot of that. So when you say like fair to the character, like in terms of how they're structured and 
what positions they're put in versus the commentary that you pointed out that he is putting out there of look of look at how they're treating Albertine, look at how they're treating Rachel Winfrey. Including the narrator, who, as we discussed earlier, is right. kind of a, a dick. So I'm assuming that that's part of it, that that's part of what Proust is doing, is that you kind of, as a reader, you you if, if you're reading well, you're perceiving that these characters have goodness in them. And yet you can do that through the narrator's own poor perception and poor judgment. Mm -hmm. And that in turn gives you a reading of the, of the narrator himself. And he does such a a masterful job of that. Yeah. It's really quite impressive because especially nowadays when you read, I just feel like in contemporary writing, you get, you get much more direct opinion that's not as well hidden through a narrator that is mm-hmm. like this. It's just well, you think- yeah. There's an adv- there's an advancing of of a I don't want to say a goal, but people are more direct in making a point clear yeah. because that I think more and more in our modern world, people are concerned about having their actions and words interpreted correctly. Yeah. yeah. Or in the, or maybe not even correctly, but in the way that they want them to be. And so that to me is actually my problem with a lot of modern shit is like, no, the fun is it interpreting yeah. it. And it's up to us to interpret your art rather than you telling me what your art yeah. is. Because then that's not, not interesting. He it's has to assume a certain degree of intelligence in his reader and also assume a certain degree of grief from the reader who doesn't get it. Mm. Because mm-hmm. if you read this and you're like, man, we should cancel Proust. He sounds like an awful human being. Don't let him publish anything more. When his point is actually... <laughs> behind that curtain that there are levels of perception and you're seeing the complexity of this narrator in his misunderstanding of the world around him, which is also, you know, each one of us has that similar misunderstandings in, in different places as well. Well, I mean, that's the whole point of the the last part of this book. It's mostly filtered through the lens of love, but it's, everything else it's class it's status it's familial we become fools to ourselves because we start to view the world in a very certain way and that just blocks everything out Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. you're gonna be you're gonna have blinders on for something whatever Mm -hmm. that is just the way we're built yeah i remember really early on it might have been the first volume but we were talking about proust's way of writing about being young and in love and I was like, no, this isn't love, this is infatuation. He's talking about this character projecting and basically only seeing himself in whomever he's infatuated with. And I, uh, I used the term, which at the time I was like, ah, oh, I kind of didn't like that, but I called Bruce like the 1900s uh, proto Tinder fuckboy, <laughs> which is just like continually looking for like somebody to give him new attention and new you know, new feelings of, of, uh, self-worth and just like the quick, easy stuff. And, uh, I think I still stand by that because it's continually, continually the, the theme here of how often he's trying to manipulate people, this character, just only using people for his own thing. And to your point, yes, it's through the lens of this concept of love and infatuation relationships, but it's easily the same thing across all these other items too and so i think the yeah that infatuation on the brain whether it's other humans or class or power or greed whatever it is is we're frail our brains are soupy add to that he does the 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 sort of philosopher proust adds to that that none of us are in control and that we think that we do things for these reasons that you state and those certainly affect us but we're actually in pursuit of something that is not accessible to our conscious minds. And I have a passage about this towards the end of the book where he's talking about sort of love. What is, what is the love of a woman? Beneath the outward appearance of the woman it is to those invisible forces with which she is incidentally accompanied that we address ourselves as to obscure deities. It is they whose goodwill is necessary to us, with whom we seek to establish contact without finding any positive pleasure in it. The woman herself, during our assignation with her, does little more than put us in touch with those goddesses. We have, by way of oblation, promised jewels and travels, uttered incantations, which mean that we adore, and at the same time, contrary incantations, which mean that we are indifferent. We have used 
all our power to obtain a fresh, a fresh assignation, but one that is accorded to us without constraint. Would we in fact go to so much trouble for the woman herself if she were not complimented by those occult forces, considering that once she has left us, we are unable to say how she was dressed and realize that we never even looked at her. <laughs> That's a good passage. Amen. And sorry to, to quote Baum here at the end, but to go back similarly to what we were talking about, but about being blind to certain things, there's, and here he's using Charlou. He says, Thus, Monsieur de Charlou lived in a fool's paradise, like the fish that thinks that the water in which it is swimming extends beyond the glass wall of its aquarium, which mirrors it. While it does not see close beside it in the shadow the amused stroller who is watching its gyrations, or the all-powerful keeper who, at the unforeseen and fatal moment, postponed for the present in the case of the baron, for whom the keeper, in Paris, will be Mademoiselle Verderine, will extract it without compunction from the environment in which it was happily living, to fling it into another. Moreover, the races of mankind, insofar as they are no more than collections of individuals, may furnish us with examples more extensive, but identical in each of their parts of this profound, obstinate, and disconcerting blindness. Yeah, we're all just fishes in a bowl, man. Can I can I quote bomb if you guys are quote yeah. bombing? Okay, I'm going to take us in a different direction. Delighted to have met you, she said. Greetings to St. Lou, if you see him. In making this speech, Madame de Cranbermer... <laughs> fuck. Cranbermer? This is great. Cranbermer. Okay, we're, we're probably just going to keep this because it fits with the, with the context. Yeah. Madame de Cranbermer pronounced the name St. Loup. I never discovered who had pronounced it thus in her hearing, or what had led her to suppose that it ought to be so pronounced. However that may be, for some weeks afterwards, she continued to say St. Loup, and a man who had great admiration for her and echoed her in every way did the same. If other people said St. Lou, they would insist, would say emphatically, St. Loup, either to teach <laughs> either to teach the others a lesson indirectly or to distinguish themselves from them. But no doubt women of greater social prestige than Madame de Cambremer told her or gave her indirectly to understand that this was not the con correct pronunciation and that she regarded as a sign of originality was a solecism which would make people think her little conversant with the usages of society. For shortly afterwards, Madame de Cambremer was again saying Saint Lou and her admirer similarly ceased to hold out either because she had so admonished him or because he had noticed that she no longer sounded the final consonant and had said to himself that if a woman of such distinction, energy, and ambition had yielded, it must have been on good grounds. Therefore, they don't know how to pronounce, <laughs> pronounce shit <laughs> either. And I don't feel bad about how poorly I just read that passage because <laughs> they're all struggling. And I think I've just outed myself of not being high class and I'm okay with that. You <laughs> scum. Somebody's got to give the lower class angle, and it's me. You know, sir, she's a fine lady, my sister is. She plays the piano, she talks Spanish, and you'd never believe it for my sister of the humble employee who's taking you up in the lift. But she denies herself nothing. Madame has a maid to herself, and she'll have her own carriage one day, I shouldn't wonder. She's very pretty if you could see her. A bit too high and mighty, but well, you can understand that. She's full of fun. She never leaves a hotel without relieving herself first in a wardrobe or a dresser or a drawer. Just to leave a little keepsake with the chambermaid who'll have to clean up. Sometimes she does it in a cab. <laughs> and after she's paid <laughs> And after she's paid her fares, she'll hide my <laughs> You got this. <laughs> she'll hide behind a tree. And she doesn't half laugh when the cabbie finds he's gotta clean his cab after her. My father had another stroke of luck when he found my young brother, this Indian prince. He used to know long ago. It's not the same style of thing, of course, but it's a superb position. If it wasn't for the traveling, it'd be a dream. I'm the only one still on the shelf, but you never know. We're a lucky family. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Perhaps one day I shall be president of the Republic. But I'm keeping you babbling. I had not uttered a single word and was beginning to fall asleep as I listened to the flow of his. Good night, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. If everybody had as kind a heart as you, there wouldn't be any poor people left. But as my sister says, there must always be poor people so that now that I'm rich, I can shit on them. You'll pardon the expression. <laughs> Good night, sir. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I was listening to that on audio and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> You're telling me you've never relieved yourself in a closet or a taxi cab? Yeah, <laughs> Come on. <laughs>